so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, our first presenter is Ligia Onofre. She's uh, from the Neurology Service. She's joined us on the neural ophthalmology um, side of things. She's jumped in, been a real asset in clinic. So she's going to talk to us today about the ophthalmic manifestations of neurofibromatosis. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Great. So um, my presentation wa was inspired by this gentleman who was a 33-year-old gentleman who came into clinic because he failed his DMV vision test. Um, he had a pale optic nerve that was seen by his optometrist. And when he came into clinic, his visual exam had a visual acuity that was normal in the right eye, a slightly abnormal in the left eye, 20-25. He had an APB and a pale optic disc as well as Lish nodules. He came in to tell us he has some kind of NF1, but, NF, but he didn't know if it was one or two. Um, so we made the diagnosis pretty much easily for him. Uh, so we thought he probably had an optic glioma and referred him for an MRI. The report that I just saw last night is that he has this uh, kind of erosion into the petrous and occipital bones, but no glioma. So we will need to get his uh, MRI and look at it further. So what are the characteristics of NF1? Well, it's first of all a um, autosomal do dominant disorder. The locus is on chromosome 17, and it's thought to lead to a loss of transcription of neurofibromin. It's very, very common, one in 3,000 live births, uh, and it has prominent cutaneous manifestations like cafe au lait spots, skin fold freckles, and neurofibromas, as well as hematomatous nodules of the iris. It is um, commonly uh, involving the bones in the face, and you can see dysplasia of the bones there. And there's a tendency to develop certain times of tumors, especially of the peripheral and central nervous system. Uh, there are ser several um, variant syndromes, and one of the more common ones is Legia syndrome, which um, has cafe au lait spots, uh, axillary freckling, macrocephaly, but no peripheral and nervous system tumors, and there is no specific preventive treatment. And so um, I wanted to go over the diagnosis criteria. You have to have two or more of the following, uh, more than six cafe au lait macules greater than fi five millimeters in diameter in pre-pubertal uh, individuals and more than 15 millimeters in post-pubertal individuals. You have to have more than two neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma, freckling uh, in the axillary or inguinal region, optic glioma, more than two Lish nodules, bony lesions and a first or first degree uh, relative with NF1. Just to remind ourselves about NF2, which is often confused with, uh, NF2 is an autosomal dominant disorder that um, has mutations in the tumor suppressor gene Merlin, Schwannelman, and chromosome 22, uh, is characteristically presenting with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, and uh, the most prominent optic manifestation on that one is posterior subcapsular cataract, so a little bit different than NF1. So what are the ocular manifestations of NF1? As I learned, there are way more than what we learned on step one uh, for medical school. There's presumed neurofibromas of the conjunctiva, prominent corneal uh, nerves, posterior ambiotoxin, Lish nodules, congenital ectopian uvae, heterochromia, iritis, uh, neurofibroma of ciliary nerves, plexiform neurofibromas of the island orbit, glaucoma, angle abnormalities, choroidal hematomas, retinal scars, congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, myelinated nerve fibers, astrocytic hematomas, optic nerve head gliomas, optic gliomas, and strabismus, so quite a few. Instead, I actually, instead of going through everything, I chose to focus on the more common manifestations, and um, Lish nodules are number one. Um, they are hematomas of the iris pigment epithelium, and they look like dome-shaped papules that project from the surface of the iris. Um, even though it's the most common manifestation, it's not pathognomonic. Uh, and it's more <coughs> prevalent with increasing age, about 50% on age five, up to 95 to 100% in adults over 30. You find them in all races, and they're best appreciated by tangential broad beam illumination. Um, they vary widely in appearance depending on the background color of the iris. In blue and green irises, they look pale to medium brown with feathery margins, and in dark brown, they look cream colored, dome shaped, and extremely well defined. Um, they are kind of present, in, arranged in a random fashion, and um, they can sometimes be just in the angle. They vary in the size and number, so you can have as little as one small papule uh, up to many, many 
uh, lish nodules. These are just some pictures of how the lish nodules look. So you can just kind of point to them. And here, <coughs> some more pictures in light color dyes. So if you have lish, no lish nodules, you can be affected. You can otherwise have no other manifestations. Um, you can find them in variant syndromes. And you can find them also in patients with segmental neurofibromatosis where just one part of the body is affected and the Lish nodules are usually on the affected side, even if they have no other ophthalmic manifestations. And very, very rarely you can actually find them in cases of NF2. Um, so the other really prominent uh, manifestation of NF1 is orbital facial manifestations. So just to remind ourselves kind of why neurofibromas causes, you can think of schwannoma as an encasing the nerve and lo causing localized compression, which is usually benign, um, but causes mass effect, versus a neurofibroma, which is composed of Schwann cells, per perineural cells, and fibroblasts that infiltrates the nerve from which it arises. Um, usually you have unilateral involvement, as you can see in this picture and this picture. Um, however, you can have very rarely um, bilateral involvement, like in the middle picture. And nobody actually knows why um, it's more prominent on one side versus bilateral. Um, you can have upper eyelid swelling or fullness, which you can see in all the pictures, um, ptosis of the upper eyelid, the lateral canthus can be detached, uh, you can get bony dysplasia of the scalar orbit, proptosis, and globe dystopia. Um, and then uh, you can get diplopia because of infiltration of uh, cranial nerves three, four, and six, um, and as well, as well as cranial uh, nerve five infiltration, which leads to facial numbness. Uh, you can find strabismus and gliopia, mm, as well as um, congenital glaucoma that can ca uh, cause an S-shaped uh, ptosis, like the one in this uh, middle picture. This is uh, the same individual at different stages in his life. So when he's a young child, kind of middle adulthood and earlier adulthood. Um, and he had pretty aggressive uh, progression of his neurofibroma requiring many, many resections. So uh, the most scary complications for a lot of people um, is optic pathway gliomas. They're present in 15 to 20% of patients. Um, they are low-grade pilocytic astrocytomas that can grow in the optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, and hypothalamus. They are histologically benign, uh, usually asymptomatic. Um, they can be non-progressive. Um, they can cause visual loss, proptosis, and endocrine abnormalities associated with precocious puberty. Uh, Two-thirds of these tumors present by age seven, and most of these are asymptomatic. They affect pretty much um, the optic nerve, then cause painless visual loss, proptosis, strabismus, and nystagmus. And visual loss can uh, vary from 2020 to no light perception. Uh, you get visual field deficits with sicocentroscotomas, bitemporal hemianopsia, homonymous hemianopsia. Um, this is a picture of a little girl um, who had a quite um, impressive uh, optic nerve glioma in this eye. This is her MRI, um, and you can see it over here. And then this is her uh, globe after it was taken out, and you can see how thick um, this nerve is, and this is her with a prosthetic. This is uh, another picture of an MRI uh, from a different individual, and you can see bilateral optic nerve um, gliomas. What's um, interesting about gliomas is that you can actually have them bilaterally as opposed to the um, dysplasia of the bones that usually tends to happen unilaterally. Uh, so for exam, for glioma, look for an afferent pupillary defect. You should look for optic disc edema, optic atrophy, choroidal fold, discomatopsia, ophthalmoplegia, proptosis, and nystagmus. If you have it in the hypothalamus, you can have precocious puberty, hydrocephalus, headache, nausea, vomiting, and diplopia. Um, and especially in children, these can be hard to detect initially. Um, on MRI or CT, you can see fusiform enlargement of the optic nerve, shrinking of the optic nerve, enlargement and enhancement of the optic nerve chiasm or retrochiasm of visual pathways. All asymptomatic patients with NF1 uh, who are younger than eight should undergo screening. Uh, and then if you're over eight, you should still undergo screening every two years until you reach eight, age 18. 
our patient had not had any more screening after about age 12. Um, so resection of optic nerve uh, gliomas can be a treatment option if you have no vision, if you have severe proptosis or uh, cosmetic concerns, as well as pain uh, in a blind eye. Uh, intrastate chiasma or retrochiasmal uh, OPDs are considered not resectable except for exophytic or cystic components. Uh, some tumors can undergo spontaneous regression, uh, and treatment includes observation, surgical excision, chemotherapy, and radiation. And I go, won't go into particulars because that would be a whole grand round in itself. So what are my conclusions? NF1 is extremely common, <coughs> one in 3,000 births. Um, the most common manifestations are uh, Lish nodules, orbitofacial abnormalities, and optic nerve gliomas. Um, and I just took out of this that there's such a wide spectrum of Lish nodules. Um, and that uh, optic nerve uh, gliomas is actually a, a screening is a really important part of NF1 care. One that we should be more sensitive to as neurologists when we uh, tell our patients kind of what the spectrum of care should include. That's it. So uh, next we have Akbar Shakur. Um, we've had two years of Akbar and it's been amazing from a resident perspective. Uh, we're really gonna miss him, but I'm glad to know that he's going into academics so at least these uh, lucky New Yorkers can enjoy him. So let's give 